tonight's talk by Steve Lexen, and I think you probably have all heard of Steve, and you've heard certainly of Chaco Canyon before. So his talk tonight is, What Was Chaco Really? Or there's another way to read that. You may see it as, What Was Chaco? And at the end, you may say, Really? <laughs> <laughs> so let's see how, um, what Steve has to tell us about Chaco. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, I imagine everybody here knows a lot about Chaco or knows about Chaco or you probably wouldn't be here tonight. Um, so I'll assume that, that there's a familiarity with the place. But I did want a, a show of hands of how many people are members of Archaeology Southwest. That's great. Um, for those of you that aren't members of Dr. Doley's organization, Archaeology Southwest is sponsoring this. Um, I've long been a, a fan of that organization. Uh, for doing things like this, uh, for doing just really magnificent basic research, and one of the, the best basic research organizations in the Southwest. Doing a lot of collaborative stuff with tribes, uh, which is very, very important these days, and, and a number of other programs that, uh, I think they had a handout that tells you more about the organization, but, but um, he didn't ask me to do this. <laughs> Bill didn't ask me to do this, but yeah, think about, think about supporting the organization. In the publicity for this talk, at least the stuff that I saw, um, it said, I didn't write this, it said, come hear what Steve Luxon thinks about what was Chaco really. Well, I'm not going to tell you. Okay, maybe when you get the questions and answers, if I'm feeling like it, I'll tell you what I think about Chaco. But I'm going to tell you a lot about how the archaeologists have thought about Chaco and how you could figure out what Chaco was, because I think, I think it's a solvable problem. Um, the, the mystery of Chaco Canyon, with a capital M, the mystery of Chaco Canyon, is a great failure of Southwestern archaeology. Uh, we've been working there, not we, me personally, I just retired, but I'm not this old. Uh, we've been working there for over 100 years, all right? There's been a lot of really smart people working at Chaco, and that doesn't, isn't me either, but um, a lot of smart people putting a lot of money, of energy and money, your money, uh, a lot of your money into Chaco for 100 years, and the archaeology there's pretty easy, okay? Compared to what goes on around here, they didn't build a city on top of it. I mean, Chaco's there. You're going to walk into this, the buildings, the building's still standing up. Um, you know, it had a bit of a history, maybe 500 years, but that, you know, in, in archaeology, that's, that's nothing. That's not a big deal. Um, it's the best dated site, if you take the whole canyon, probably in the whole world, a prehistoric site in the, in the whole world, with all those, you know, at this point, tens of thousands of, tr of trimming dates. It's, you know, wonderful preservation. You can see it. You don't have to dig Phoenix off of it. Um, it's not that old, uh, and it's not that strange. You know, it's just, it, I'll get to Maybe I'll get to what I think about it. it you know, it's, um, it's not Easter Island. It's not Stonehenge. It's an agricultural society in the north edge of Mexico. The fact that, that archaeologists, and I'll, I'll, I brought some quotes with me, I'll, I'll pull those out later probably, that the archaeologists are content to have it be a mystery is kind of an admission to defeat. And, and frankly, if I were you guys, I'd ask for your money back. It's ridiculous. We, should, you know, we, we get paid to figure these things out. That's what we get paid to do. Um, recently, I had some ideas about Chaco where I said, oh, I think this kind of solves that mystery, meaning, you know, it's buying into the hype of the mystery, that, that, you know, this is probably the solution, and I get hate mail for this. Um, <laughs> yeah, archaeologists are really interested in keeping it a mystery. Um, many of you I know, know my good friend, and, and I would like to call him my mentor, Gwen Vivian, who is by the grand old man of, of Chaco, for sure. Uh, Gwen wrote a really cool book with Bruce Hopert uh, from down at ASM called the Chaco Handbook, and I bet some of you own it. If you don't, if you're interested in Chaco, it's worth the investment. Um, it went into a second edition in 2012, and Gwen and, and Bruce, in sort of the introduction, say that, you know, of course they're trying to sell books too, but um, Chaco Canyon presents a most in, in the most, excuse me, Chaco Canyon presents the most enduring and intriguing questions of any prehistoric site in the world. Um, perhaps this is the biggest mystery of Chaco Canyon. For the present, the mystery of Chaco Canyon remains just that, a mystery. That's hers. <laughs> <laughs> this is important. <laughs> okay, that's important. Um, you know, here's Gwen who studied Chaco all his life. His father studied Chaco all, almost all his life. At least for rhetorical purposes, being content to say it's a mystery. And that appeals to a lot of us, too. We want to go out there and feel like it's mysterious. I would submit that if the boundary between the United States and Mexico wasn't there, it wouldn't be a mystery at all. 
I mean, that boundary wasn't there at 1000 AD, and you know, it's just the north end of Mexico. Um, archaeological opinions on Chaco were all over the map, and again, this, this to me is embarrassing. It's, it's, it's strange. It's, you know, it, it, it's, we shouldn't allow it. <laughs> Everybody should agree with me. That's okay. Um, there, there's one group, which at this point is more in the minority, although it's gaining speed again, that Chaco is Pueblo that it's you know, a canyon full of Pueblos. And Gwyn Vivian would be you know, probably, I thought, the, the rear guard of that. Uh, Chip Wills at UNM and Steve Plogg, uh, University of Virginia, are kind of crawling on that bandwagon. That it's a canyon full of agricultural villages. I, I'm not gonna go through and you know, make fun of my friends here, but that, that's not gonna work, because it's, it's no place to grow corn. Uh, Navajo people that lived in Chaco Canyon, they knew how to grow corn. They were, you know, Navajo people were pretty good at growing corn. And the maximum population of Navajo people in Chaco at its height, according to Dave Brugge, who knows more about it than anybody else, is like 300 people. You know, maybe you can keep a few hundred people alive growing corn out there, but you can't keep 3,000 people alive growing corn at Chaco. And the evidence is almost incontrovertible that you have a class society um, from the architecture. I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, that you don't, you don't have class societies where you have an upper class and a lower class, where you have nobles and commoners in Pueblos. That's just not how Pueblos work but you have it at Chaco. I mean, then that's pretty hard to deny. Um, okay, so some archeologists push that it's a Pueblo and a lot, that has a lot to do with modern heritage issues and, and modern Pueblo's uh, interest in the place. Um, a lot of folks have seen Chaco and said, ooh, you know, trying to turn it into Zuni today or turn it into um, San Ildefonso or someplace at the turn of the 19th century, you know, that's not gonna work, but let's keep it sort of in a, a mode, in a space that makes us comfortable, is, you know, that we think Pueblos are not supposed to stand there. <laughs> we, we think Pueblos are all about egalitarian spiritualism, communalism, uh, you know, all this stuff that we think is probably nice. Um, let's make it a pilgrimage center. Let's make it a, a holy place, and it probably was. I'm not denying that it, it you know, was a holy place or a sacred place. So a pilgrimage center is a nice model, uh, along with some other things that are floating around, or it's a, a popular model. There, there are things that I would call uniquities, and that's a real word, you can use it in Scrabble. Um, it means that it's a, something we haven't seen before. That kind of a deal where you have a, a built center uh, that is a, a, a center for pilgrimages in the New World. In the Old World, you know, these happen. They, they happen, in, especially on the subcontinent of India. Uh, in the New World, there's exactly one other place that's like that. There's certainly lots of pilgrimages in Latin America, and you know, well, lots of pilgrimages here too, but not the, the models that people are putting forward for Chaco with you know, tens of thousands of people coming in, having a county fair or something, and you know, getting their babies blessed and then going home. Um, so it's, it's a uniquity. It, it doesn't mean it didn't happen, but if you think about the, the statistical aspects of it, if it's something that's really weird and unique, the odds are against it, all right? Could be that they're right, but the odds are kind of against it. If you can come up with a better idea that's, that's not so outre, outre um, you m might be doing better to go with the other model. Um, third model is it's a political center, a polity. And it could be those other things too. These aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. It certainly is a Pueblo place in the sense it's part of Pueblo traditions. It's just not a Pueblo in the sense of our stereotype of Pueblos as, as independent farming villages full of you know, people who are all on the same social level held together by ritual. It's not that. It's a political system. There's a lot of pushback on that, that, that archeologists don't want to let that happen north of Mexico. And this goes way back into the history of anthropology, you know, back in the 19th century uh, of American anthropology that basically had what are essentially racist roots, where in, in the 19th century, if you remember your history, we were busy killing Indians. I mean, it's what we did. Or, or sending them to Oklahoma, um, you know, pushing them off their lands. The anthropologists at that time mostly were very interested in Indians. They were, were pro-Indian. I'm thinking of Lewis Henry Morgan, people like that. But they, they, in the 19th century, you'll also recall that in the first half of the 19th century, um, the country was built on racism. I mean, you, you, know, you had slavery in the South. It was just an institution. It was our peculiar institution. So a good Victorian era gentleman up North, even would be mildly racist, where you know, it's a white man's burden and all that stuff. So Lewis Henry Morgan, looked at American Indians who he was very much a champion of and said, oh, you know, these people were savages and that was not a bad thing necessarily, it was a stage. You were barbarism, you know, savagery, barbarism, they were barbarians, excuse me, savagery, barbarian, and civilized. 
there were middle barbarians um, somewhere in there, um, and that's all they ever were, that there were no, and, and actually Lewis Henry Morgan said there never were any empires or never in states, even in Mexico. I mean, he applied this all, all over the New World, that it never happened, and those kinds of governments never happened. Nobody in Mexico, you know, the Mexican anthropologists laughed about this. They said, yeah, wait a minute, we got the Aztecs, you know. I don't know what you're thinking, but... But it stuck north of the border. And the guys that taught, 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 the guys that taught me, just, you know, it's become uh, embedded in American anthropological archaeology that there were never any polities, there were never any states north of Mexico. Well, Chaco's north of Mexico, therefore, it can't be a state. I'll get, I'll get back to that, possibly. Um, in that camp, uh, Actually, the beginnings of that for Chaco was Gwen Vivian's father, Gordon Vivian. And Gordon Vivian, back in the 60s, when he published a site report, 64. Okay, this is in, in uh, at that point, pilgrimage centers hadn't popped up. So in the 60s, it was either Chaco was a canyon full of Pueblos, which was the prevailing view uh, at that time, or Gordon Vivian's view, who knew Chaco pretty well. I mean, he was the guy that was the park archaeologist out there for many, 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 many years. He said in, in 64 that developments in Chaco in the 11th and early 12th centuries were not in the direct line of the Pueblo continuum, as it was known at the beginning of the historic period. Uh, the Chaco was not on that some sort of historical or evolutionary trajectory that would give you San Ildefonso, that would give you Hopi, that would give you Zuni. Um, the continuation of the direction taken by Chaco would have carried it even further out of the stream of development that culminated in the Rio Grande. And he's talking about ever-increasing control, specialization, centralization of authority at Chaco, which he saw in the 60s, was simply not compatible with the slant that directed the destiny of the basket maker Rio Grande continuum. <laughs> he called Chaco a, a cultural experiment or deviation that failed as it strayed from the main course of Northern Pueblo history. Um, Gordon Vivian saw that Chaco no, Chaco wasn't a Pueblo. It, wasn't, it was Pueblo history, okay? It's absolutely part of Pueblo history, but the key thing is it's part of history, where history doesn't lead in some uh, lockstep linear line from you know, the earliest basket maker people up to, you know, striving to become um, Taos. You know, the way the archeologists parse out the prehistory in the Southwest, you have the thing called Paco system, which some of you I'm sure are aware of that is basket maker three and Pueblo one, two, three, and four. And each of those stages, like they add an element that will turn them into, into Santa Clara. Right? First they get corn, oh boy. And then they get pottery, hot dog. And then they, you know, then they have kivas. I'm, I'm going stage to stage. So they keep adding stuff. Uh, then we see kachinas, we're getting closer. Uh, then they mass their rooms into, into Pueblos and bingo, they finally, you know, it's like they've been wanting to be Santa Clara or San Ildefonso or one of those places way from the 500s and they just couldn't, they could hardly wait to get there. That's not how history works. That's not how history works, okay? We need to give these guys the ability to have history where they go off and do other stuff that doesn't, doesn't survive into the present. Which brings me to my, my bete noir here of upstreaming, which I'll rail on for the course of the evening here, of taking modern Pueblo practices and projecting them back into the past. And this is when I got into archeology, span and I, I might get into some personal history in a minute here, uh, one of the strong suits of the Southwest is we had living Pueblo people here, so we could flesh out the, the archaeological record. And I thought, okay, that's, that's, that's cool. And you can take stuff out of an ethnography, out of a description of what was happening at Zuni in uh, 1890, and paste it on a Pueblo Benito, and, and that fills in lots of holes that you can't know archaeologically. I've come to realize that that's actually probably clinically insane. I, uh, time does not work that way. Time does not work from the present back into the past. Time works from the past to the present. Our job as archaeologists is to figure out what the hell was happening in the past and how on earth that led to Zuni. Okay, nothing in the past predicts that you will wind up with, Pueb with Pueblos the way we know them today. They stumble all over, not stumble, they make all kinds of bold moves that fail uh, and some that succeed in all kinds of directions and what happens in you know, a sort of Darwinian sense is you know, th that they wind up being Pueblos. But there's a lot of history in between. The archaeologists between Lewis Henry Morgan, who said they're always barbarians, and it's a stage that they, that they could never bust beyond, they could never break that glass ceiling. And then the archaeologist upstreaming, because it's a, it beats thinking, you know, <laughs> you know it, make, it makes it easy. And you know, I do, I do this all the time too, and I, I'm being facetious, I, I love my colleagues, respect my colleagues. I no longer have much use for upstreaming, because again, that's, that's not how time works. You know, stop to think about it, our challenge is to figure out, independent of that, what, you know, what, what's happening in the 18th century, what happened in the 10th century? 
to figure that out on its own terms. And that's not easy. That's hard. That's hard. That's the first glimmer of why we might not be embarrassed about Chaco. It's a long time ago. It's kind of hard to figure out what happened a long time ago if you lose that crutch of, of modern Pueblo um, living. I might go off into a bit of autobiography here because it will probably explain a bit about how I think we should go about understanding Chaco. That I, I don't think I get accused of being Chaco centric by people, lots of people, probably people in this room. I don't know. Um, I don't think Chaco was important because I worked there. I worked there because it was bloody obvious that it was important. And in the early 70s, which is when I got started, a long, long time ago, to me anyway, uh, Chaco was not that well known. I'll read you another quote. I, I'm not going to read quotes all night long, but I, I brought along a few. A textbook at that time in 1973 was written by uh, Paul Martin, who was a distinguished older archaeologist, and, and Fred Plogg, who was a hot dog young archaeologist at that point. And, they, and when they talk about Chaco, it's called the Archaeology of Arizona, but you can't not talk about Chaco no, no matter where you are in the Southwest. You have to come to grips with Chaco. They said in 73, and I'm just getting into this stuff. I was like a year or two into it at that point and still learning, obviously. <laughs> I'm still learning today, I hope. Um, in spite of the great towns that developed at Chaco and the interest the region has attracted, less is really known of the area than almost any other southwestern district. Now, I think there were possibly there's a bit of hyperbole in there, but yeah, they were saying that, that the, what we knew about Chaco came from reports that were published from excavations in the 20s and, the, and with Gwyn uh, in the 30s, Gordon, excuse me, Gordon Vivian in the, thir in the 30s. Less, it, it, less is really known of the area than almost any other southwestern district. It's amazing that so little work has been done there and so, significant, so few significant reports published. That's when I was getting into this. Um, so Chaco got on my to-do list, not that I was going to figure it out, but I wanted to work there you know, and as, as part of a project. And I, I first came to Chaco things uh, working at Salmon Ruins, which uh, is up north of Chaco, about 60 miles. It's a big Chaco great house uh, on the San Juan River. And Archaeology Southwest has, has sponsored a lot of research at Salmon. The original research was done by an amazing woman named Cynthia Irwin Williams, who's no longer with us, but uh, uh, Archaeology Southwest, she died uh, too young, and Archaeology Southwest stepped in, and, and Paul Reed and his gang up there are pulling together what we know about Salmon. I worked at Salmon for a few years because it was a Chaco site. That was my toe in the door. And then I went for 10 years from 76 to 86, I think, for the National Park Service Chaco Project, which was great fun. I was actually working at Chaco. Okay, so I didn't have any fixed opinions on Chaco, at least I don't think I did, except that they moved every two years or whatever. <laughs> you know, I'm carrying over my childhood psychoses, but um, uh, sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have you know much of an opinion about Chaco, except that having worked at Salmon, I was aware that you couldn't understand it just looking at Chaco Canyon. Chaco, <laughs> Chaco was bigger than than Chaco Canyon itself, because here's Salmon ruins up here, 60 miles away, or 50 miles away. Excuse me. Um, so I, I came with that notion in my head. Uh, but the, the official party line when I joined the Park Service project was that Chaco came out of Mexico. And that was Alden Hayes, uh, who was a man I respect enormously, um, who's been gone for some years now. But he, he published the first of the Chaco reports, um, a whole series, you know, bookshelf full of these things by the time it got done. And his conclusion on Chaco, he was looking just, he did a survey of the canyon where he wasn't digging, he was just recording sites. But his conclusion was that Chaco, not that, um, well, that it came out of Mexico by some means, that either people from Chaco were inspired by Mexico or people from Mexico, Mesoamerica, came up and uh, uh, took, took over and ordered things and had things done in the right, proper way. And somewhere above middle barbarism, you know, they're pushing, pushing up against that glass ceiling. The temper of the times, and this is eight, you know, early 80s, was against uh, L, that uh, the archaeology of that point, uh, the late 70s, early 80s, uh, wanted everything to be local and small. And I, no point in going into why we thought that at the time. But, uh, we did. So I was uh, in the soup that I was in, or the milieu that I was in, I, I, I didn't like that Mexican stuff at all. I mean, nah, we don't need no Me we don't need Mesoamerica up here. I mean, it's all local stuff. And I wrote some things about that, and I realized that, no, there were some things that Chaco, you know, I, I argued with, uh, with Al in, in print and with another guy named Charles de Peso um, in print, you know, saying, no, they're wrong about this and this and this, and says, boy, they may be right about that and that and that. Well, that was troublesome to me. I mean, I, I filed that one away, that, wow, there's, you know, 
if they're right about that and that and that, maybe they actually are right about the other stuff too, or at least some of it. Um, a lot of the work I did uh, for the Park Service, not all of it, but a lot of the work I did for the Park Service was uh, looking at the big building, looking at the architecture of the canyon. And one of the things that was just stone cold clear is that you had two classes of people out there. You had people that lived in the great houses that were architecturally just night and day from the folks that lived in normal houses. You had the one percenters on the hill and you had the 99 percenters who were living in five rooms in a kiva. Five rooms in a kiva is like, like a little rubber stamp and they're perfectly fine little houses that commoners lived in, but if you took the floor area of one of those commoner houses and compressed it, you could fit it in one room of Pueblo Benito. I mean, the scale differences are just, you know, you have to be, well, you have to not want to see it. The people that don't like the idea of a political structure out there or a class structure, I remember one review, a recent review, a very influential review about Chaco that said, well, there are no palaces. You know, we would, you know, if this were a political system, we expect to see palaces. I'm sitting here thinking, Pueblo Benito, I've, I've calculated this, weighs 40,000 tons of sandstone stacked up 30 feet tall over the size of a major league baseball field. Why can't you see that? <laughs> you know? That's what that is. It's a palace, all right? Uh, we know from a, a number of analyses, or we think we know, from a number of analyses uh, now that there's 500 rooms there and maybe 12 families, all right? So not all those rooms are part of houses. Some of those rooms are warehouses. Some of those rooms are other functions. Some of those rooms are just building to build, you know, to be bigger than the other, you know, the guys at Chetra Kettle. Uh, it's literally that simple. But yeah, I mean, it's really, really clear that you have two classes of people. Uh, Gwen Vivian got around that. Gordon Vivian picked up on that. Uh, Vivian Sr. picked up on that and said, you know, this is not going towards Pueblos. You got, you got the haves and the have-nots. Gwen Vivian explains that as two different ethnic groups, which, you know, it's a, an interesting idea. Obviously, you can tell I, I, don't, I don't agree. I mean, I, don't, I just don't see that. Uh, and I, again, you know, it's 40,000 tons stacked over a baseball field. You know, it's so hard to see. Uh, and there's six more of them that big. So that, that was troublesome, because I, you know, I go into Chaco not knowing what to think about it, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm saying, hey, wait, you know, it's really obvious that you got one class that's living in the great houses and another class of people that are living in the small houses. And subsequent work is just, not mine, well, some of mine, but a lot, by lots of other people's borne that out, that the people in the, in the great houses are living differently than the people in the small houses. People in the great houses are not working. They have people working for them, probably slaves. They're knocking back at Miller time and drinking cacao. Uh, they, they're wearing parrot feathers, which, you know, that's a big deal in Mexico and macaws. Uh, they got copper dangling all over them um, and more turquoise than, you know, than God. The people in the small houses don't have that stuff. I mean, and, and it's just, you know, lots and lots of evidence stacked up now that you have a, an upper class and a lower class, a ruling class and, a, and a nobles and commoners. So that was troublesome. Um, then I got to, to working with Native American people. Uh, I mean, I was working with Native American people all along, but working with Native American people on an intellectual level. And uh, this was when I, I went from the Park Service by way of Arizona State Museum to the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. I was a curator there. Uh, working a lot with, a lot with Rio Grande people, uh, Rio Grande Pueblo people, and then putting together exhibits. Uh, guys I was working with, my you know, colleagues, say, oh yeah, you know, they're from Rio Grande Pueblo. They said, we know all about Chaco. We don't talk about it. Bad things happened out there. Oh. That's interesting because everything I'd heard about it was all goodness and light, and they're all out there being communal and you know praying all day long and you know doing whatever you know whatever we think is nice. Yeah, they said bad things happened out there, and I started asking around and reading and studying, and yeah, there's a number of stories, uh, the Karis stories, the Crescent Pueblos like Acoma and, and Laguna and Zia, where they talk about uh, White House. In some places, you see it translated as White City, where there was this place that was marvelous, it was amazing. They had parrots, they had Turquoise, they had all this stuff, but people got power over people, political power, spiritual power. And now I'm paraphrasing a Pueblo person who actually said those things. And that wasn't right. And so the, the spiritual advisors, the entities that would become Kachinas, uh, told the people that you shouldn't be living this way. You know, you need to leave here and, and turn your backs on this stuff and, and reinvent yourselves and, and not have leaders, not have rulers, not have nobility, noble families. So they did. Uh, they, they march south, and after four days, they have a ceremony. This is the Akama version. They have a ceremony of forgetting. Okay, and they obviously they didn't forget because the old guys remember this, and you know, there's some people in, the, in you know, in the tribe whose duty it is to remember these things remembers this story about what happened back there. But they had a ceremony of forgetting for everybody else, and it's really after 1300, after Chaco and Aztec, which is Chaco's successor, after they fall, and the no those noble families are either wiped out or they move. Um, or they decide they're not nobles anymore, but more likely they get wiped out or moved. 
um, that Pueblo people reinvent themselves as the Pueblo is that, that we caricature today as, as happy, peaceful, egalitarian, communal, all that stuff. That happens after 1300, and it's in reaction to, to Chaco. Um, and that's, that's in the stories. Uh, Navajo people, uh, who the archaeologists uh, until recently uh, said were not out there at the time of Chaco, you know, now it's looking more like maybe they were. They, they say they were out there. Uh, they know a lot about those, those places. Uh, when I was working for the Park Service, the labor force was all Navajo guys, because we were the only, you know, not that they liked digging ruins, but they were the only labor around, and we were the only paycheck in you know, 40 miles, so they came work with us. And some of those guys would say, well, I know what happened in this, you know, we're digging Polo Alto or something, and, and some guy would say, I know what happened in this room. Oh, yeah? <laughs> How do you know what happened in this room? He said, my, my mother told me, my grandmother told me, whatever. They have stories of, that are much more detailed, and Pueblo accounts are kind of abstracted. It's all about the principles and what you learn and what happened at White House and why we never want to do that again and we never want to have kings again. And it's all about lessons uh, and some details. But the uh, Navajo stories, because they live on that landscape, are very detailed. Okay? And maybe they heard those stories from Pueblo people and they're fresh because they actually lived next to those places where it actually happened, or maybe they were there. I don't know. But the Navajo stories are about the great gambler. And the great gambler reduces everyone, Navajo people, Pueblo people, whoever's there, to slavery. I mean, there's an upper class and a lower class, and lower class are slaves. And he, he does it through gambling games, supposedly. Um, a Navajo uh, colleague of mine, Taft Blackhorse, um, was in the room when the story was going around with a bunch of scholarly types. And Taft said, no, you, know, you, you white guys, you call him the great gambler. That was actually our king. This is his words. And you know, everybody sort of turned to him and said, Taft, is there an Navajo word for king? He said, well, no, but, but if we had a word for king, that's what we'd call him. You know, this gambler stuff kind of uh, balderizes the whole situation. This was an upper class. And you know, the first thing that the great gambler demanded of these people is build me a house, build me a palace, and then build one for my brother, and then build one for you know, my uncle, whatever. Those, those, houses, those great houses out there were built for, for the kings and for the rulers for the, the, the nobility, the ruling class. The Navajos um, and all the people uh, put up with it for a while and then they rise up and it's a class revolt. And this is also happens here, this happens with the platform men here. There's a class revolt with the commoners. And you probably know the stories around here, but at Chaco there's a class revolt, they get the great gambler and in one version they shoot him back to Mexico where he came from. And in another version they cut off his head and bury him under a rock. So you just pick, pick the version you know, that, that you like. Or, or, or pick the version that you, were, you learned as a kid, or pick the version that your clan tells, whatever. I'm not going to be too, you know, try not to be facetious about these, these traditional histories. Um, but, you know, this, these are, are strong stories. Um, and, you know, there's a, more than a kernel of fact in that. There's, a, you know, probably a, it's probably factual. Not that they shot him back to Mexico where he came from, but maybe he came from Mexico. Or he thought he came from Mexico. Put it that way. So that's troublesome. So I'm talking to, talking to, you know, Native American people, and I'm hearing things about Chaco that you know make Gordon Vivian's version sound better than more likely than Gwyn Vivian's version. I don't want to pick on Gwyn, but you know that's it's either a pueblo at this point, or it's a political system with lords and, and commoners, or it's a pilgrimage center. You know, it's something that we make up. We invent a pilgrimage center, and th that makes us happy because it explains the, uh, it still doesn't explain the great houses. I mean, no, nobody that advocates uh, advocates a pilgrimage center has ever to my satisfaction, explained why do you need a great house for a pilgrimage center? I mean, why can't you just come in and, and you know, have the pilgrimage and leave? What's, what's up with these great houses? So there's, there's a number of troublesome things. Uh, the last was, and this is actually developing at the same time as the rest, is, is realizing that it's a small world after all, in the words of Walt Disney. That you aren't, okay, I come in there having worked with Cynthia Irwin Williams at Solon Ruins outside of Chaco, realizing that you aren't going to understand Chaco unless you get outside the canyon as well. You need the canyon too, obviously, it's the center. But Chaco was bigger than the canyon. And then I realized that, that or I thought I realized, that, that our ver versions of distance, things that appall us or that we think are, you know, that's a long way between Solomon and Aztec. No, it's not. It's not. It's a hop, skip, and a jump. When Coronado comes into the Southwest, he has a support fleet. He's going inland with his, his troops. And he's got a support fleet like Alexander the Great had. And did, him, did neither of these guys any good. Um, going up the Gulf of, of uh, California, and when the, the support fleet gets to the mouth of the Colorado River, and Coronado is just making all kinds of a mess up in New Mexico, just pissing people off left, right, and sideways. The support fleet meets some Native American people down at the Gulf, at the mouth of the, Col mouth of the Colorado, and they say, oh yeah, there's more of you guys with the steel helmets up there. They, they, they knew what was happening in New Mexico within, you know, a week of what, what was going on. 
the scales that we find imposing are, are that's our scales, not their scales. Distances were not, a, not that big a deal, even though you know, we have jet planes and we have cars and we have all this kind of stuff. They still knew what was going on, and they're still deeply, deeply interconnected over large, large areas. Well, how large an area? Well, I started off by saying Chaco was the north end of Mexico. That's what it was. I mean, forget that, that that was a corollary of this, is that our modern political boundaries mean nothing. I mean, somebody writes, oh, I will get in trouble here. Um, <laughs> somebody writes a book about the archaeology of New Mexico, all right? That's silly. I mean, there's no archaeology of New Mexico. There's archaeology that happened in New Mexico that was connected with stuff in Arizona and Utah and whatever. You'll never understand it in New Mexico. I don't think anybody ever wrote a book with that title. Um, I hope, I hope, I hope. And if they did, please edit this out. Uh, <laughs> it, it, oh, it's useful to sell books, but it doesn't make any sense in the past because New Mexico wasn't there in the past. Nor was the United States, you know, there was no international boundary. Um, you're all aware of the history that we took we took the Southwest from Mexico in 1846 in a colonial war. Uh, James K. Polk, quite a, quite a president. He, he took office and said, I'm going to get, I mean, he wanted California, he said, I'm going to get Texas, uh, which is, you know, we annexed Texas and New Mexico and California, and I'm going to get Oregon. Do it in one term and not run for a second term. He got it all done. He got it all, he, and he also almost, almost fought a war with, with Britain over, over Oregon. And he gets out of office and dies three weeks later. <laughs> So, you know, he was our, our greatest colonialist. He's a mixed figure, let's put it that way. I mean, you could say, my God, what a jerk. Or you could say, well, he got us California. Um, anyway, we took it from, from Mexico. Prior to that, it was part of Mexico uh, in the Spanish and Mexican days. But they were also, they were layered over, which they're really good historically at doing this, layering over pre-existing, pre-Columbian networks and, and political uh, um, systems. That, that was how the Spanish worked. When the English and the Dutch come in, they just roll over, try to roll over them, just destroy them. The Spanish just added another layer. You know, they put a church on top of the pyramid, and all was well. And, and you know, they worked with the local officials. They didn't try and change everything. They, they, they added two more layers of nobility, three more layers of nobility on top of it all. But they, they adapted existing systems, and I think that's quite true in the Southwest, that they got to the limits of the, you know, they stopped, in, in Santa Fe and in Taos and in the San Luis Valley, because um, they were getting out of that ancient, you know, the, not ancient, the, the native um, geographic systems. They, they, they reached the limits of it. So when we came in and we draw a line that, that cuts the Southwest and Chaco and everything off from Mexico, and we nationalize those, those ruins in a, in a way that's very different than how Mexico nationalized its past. Mexico today, and since the second revolution down there, nationalized their past and everyone's an Aztec. Right? Or, or the Aztecs are part of their heritage. Uh, we didn't do that with Native Americans. Native Americans are part of the past, but it, and, and there, I'm sure there are some Native American people in the room, but for those of us that are not Native American, it's not part of our heritage per se. I mean, I wouldn't claim that Chaco is part of my heritage. Of course not. It, it's part of, I'd say it's part of the world's heritage. It's certainly Pueblo. I think I find it's an interesting place, but I wouldn't claim it as mine. Unlike what happens in Mexico, where those ruins are part of the national patrimony. So we nationalized the... the Southwest, uh, taking it out of circulation for any, any possibilities that that's where the Aztecs came from, because that was, that was hot back in the 19th century and early 20th century, that the Aztecs start in the Southwest and they, they migrate down into central Mexico. So this is Aztlan. We're in Aztlan now, the homeland of the Aztecs. We didn't want any of that uh, because we just fought a war with Mexico and we wanted to, you know, want to squash that as much as we could. So we... Um, that's the word I'm looking for. We isolated the Southwest. We said, oh, you know, it's this beyond, remote beyond compare, uh, isolated people that have developed a unique civilization unlike anything else in the world. Well, it's stuff about Chaco that, you know, it's the most enduring and puzzling, whatever, uh, mystery um, because it's isolated out of context. Okay, so to figure out what Ch Chaco is really, you've got to put it back in context. What was, okay, we've got to figure out what was happening in the 11th century in its own terms. We, you know, we got to pretend we don't know about Zuni. We've got to pretend we don't know about Hopi. We could, I, I think it's legit to use their histories. Why not? I mean, they remember their own past. Use their histories about what was happening back then, um, which is different than what was happening now. Remember the ceremony, forgetting, and all that stuff. Their accounts of the past are very, very, you know, it was very, very different from the present. Even not, I'm not denying that it's public history. Please be, let me be clear about this. Yes, of course it's part of their history. But that doesn't mean that it's, you know, that Chaco was Zuni or that Chaco was uh, San I or something like that. Understand Chaco in its own terms. Well, what, was going, what, what does that mean? Well, what was going on when Chaco was going on? Well, if we blow away that border 
And forget about those, you know, our problems with distance. They're our problems, not their problems. And we know this. We know these guys are connected with Mexico. Like I said, they're, not, they're drinking cacao. They, they're decked out in macaw feathers. Yeah, okay, there's no international boundary. Uh, we know that they're well, con you know, deeply connected with Mexico. We know it's a class society where there's nobles and commoners, which is what you would call them if they were in Mexico. And there's no problem with using these terms in Mexico. You use, use this in a, you know, an archaeological convention. If you guys were all my, my peers, you'd be out of the room by now. Okay. <laughs> And I'd be on a rail, um, you know, shortly, shortly thereafter. Um, there are commoners and, 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 and nobles. Um, there was a capital city. Chaco was a center. I mean, you all know enough about Chaco to know that there was a center. And there was a region that's defined by 150 small great houses and roads and line, especially line of sight signaling systems, things like that, that was really tied in together very tightly, or, you know, tightly. Um, if you start fishing around for models of what might Chaco might have been, and you don't take some stereotype, our stereotype of Pueblos, and try and turn them into that, don't make up something out of a pilgrimage center, which again, it could have been, but you don't, you, don't, you don't need to make up something. If you look for models from its own time, from their world, there are models that work really, really well. What's their world? Well, their world is, is the uh, early pre-classic in Mesoamerica. That's their world, that's what they knew, okay? Uh, Tula was a big deal then, maybe not as big as people uh, used to think. But you had a lot of small polities about the size of Chaco in terms of population. Uh, uh, the scales are you know, about the same. Uh, there's the early polities where their capital cities were about the size of Chaco Canyon, maybe 2,000, 3,000 people, maybe 50,000 people in the whole area. There's just scores of those in, in, in uh, Mesoamerica from Zacatecas on down. Uh, if you look what else is going on in Chaco's time, in the Mississippi River Valley, there were great civilizations, things that made Chaco look small. Okay? There's a, a, a site, um, a city called Cahokia. It's just across the river from St. Louis, exactly contemporary with Chaco. It's the biggest pyramid north of Teotihuacan. There's a lot of big sites north of Teotihuacan. This is the biggest pyramid. It's made out of dirt, so we call it a mound. <laughs> just like, you know, if Indians have a 200-foot boat, it's a canoe. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if it has 60 people, you know, and, and it's carrying 10 tons of stuff, which I'm not making this stuff up. It's a canoe. Well, you know, if they stack up a pyramid and they make it out of dirt, it's a mound, all right? Um, Cahokia itself had a population. I said that a lot of the Mesoamerican capitals in Chaco had like 3,000 people, something like that. Cahokia had, you know, 30 or 40,000 people in a, in a city, okay? This is exactly contemporary with Chaco, and they, they knew about each other. I mean, how could they not? Which, you know, clearly was the center of a large region with the same, actually the same kind of architecture. I mean, I mean that in, uh, let me scratch architecture, same kind of uh, structure as, as Chaco's region with outliers and signaling systems and all that kind of stuff. Okay, that was Chaco's world. That's what they knew. They didn't, they didn't know they were going to turn into Zuni. They didn't, they didn't know they were going to have a ceremony of forgetting. They hadn't gotten to that part yet. They were still screwing up, all right? <laughs> I mean, they were, you know, they were still living like Mesoamerican lords, which is exactly what they were. How can a, someone from you know, New Mexico be a Mesoamerican lord? Because the boundary wasn't there, all right? They thought they were Mesoamerican lords, and by God, they were right. Um, they had all the... You know, probably if somebody from Chaco waltzed down to Tula and asked to see the, the wizard, they'd fob him off on the under assistant secretary of state you know, for savages or something. But, you know, he, somebody from Cahokia went down there, they would treat him with pomp and circumstance. I mean, he was, you know, those guys at Cahokia were playing on the same level as Tula. Guys at Chaco are trying to. They're doing the best they can, all right? And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So the Pueblo people revolt. It's not, you know, the Pueblo revolt of 1680, you hear that it's, that's the first time Pueblos ever worked together. No, that's the last time, you know, until they got casinos that they, in political class that they, that they worked together. There's a revolt across the Chacoan country. They get rid of the nobles. I think a lot of the nobles move south because those noble families have been noble families for centuries. That's what they knew how to do. That's what they were supposed to do is rule. And nobody wanted to be ruled anymore. So they go down and start Casas Grandes. I suspect, or other places down there. Um, if, you, if you put Chaco in its own context and don't upstream and don't make it small, you know, make, understand that the, the geographic uh, limits are, the sky's the limit. I mean, you know, the Chaco had birds from Guatemala probably and, and the cacao from way far south of Mexico. Um, you'll, you'll figure out what Chaco is and it's not that hard. You know, once, once you get the blinders off and get out from under the, the, the the shadow of American anthropological archaeology with its colonial baggage, and you know, past our romanticizing the Southwest and this relentless upstreaming and our nationalism of the Southwest, it's not that hard to figure out what Chaco was, but I'm not going to tell you. You're going to figure it out yourself. So, <laughs> questions and answers. 
Hi. Um, I was just wondering what you feel about the uh, theory that Chaco was built with the fractal um, or, uh, mathematics for their um, Gullet, gullet, gillet? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, they certainly knew geometry. Um, and if by fractal you just mean that you know there, there's repetitive um, geometric elements, I can buy it. Uh, he gets larger in scale and layouts and does things that I'm not sure they would technically be able to do. I mean, these guys are working with, they, they do wonderful work, but they're working with naked eye and a piece of string and a rock. Okay, and I'm not sure you could do those layouts on the scales that he's talking about, but it's, it's really interesting. Uh, questions about Chaco Meridian, which is um, when I first started thinking about the Southwest historically, and it's, it's weird, I'm an archaeologist, of course I'm doing history. Well, no, the way I was trained, I'm not doing history. I'm doing science, and they're very different things. Um, Chaco Meridian was an argument that Chaco moved, it's a four-point problem. Chaco moves north and founds a second capital, and they refound the capital, Aztec ruins, and I'm sure you guys know where at, you know, about Aztec ruins. And Chaco moves north to Aztec, and then when that falls apart, that some of those families move south to Casas Grandes, because they're all on the same north-south meridian. And the people from Chaco actually built a road, what we call a road, and it's not a road in the sense of this thing out here with a light rail on it. Um, but connecting due north from Chaco to Aztec. So they left us that message. That's their history written on the ground. Um, when that first came out in 99, and it first started circulating the ideas of like 95, something like that, people were all appalled. You know, Chaco couldn't have moved to Aztec. That's too far. And, you know, there's just all these, it's, you know, it's not in San Juan County, for Christ's sake. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's in McKinley County. Uh, at this point, Everyone I know accepts the Chaco. Yeah, three points of the four-point problem are okay. Chaco moved north to Aztec. Yeah, that's, that's a done deal at this point. There's still a few people that have problems with it, but don't pay any attention to them. <laughs> um, marching south is a harder sell, in, in part because there's fewer people working at, in Casas Grandes and a couple of guys that kind of stranglehold the interpretive, and they're good guys. It's Mike Whalen and Paul Menace. They're both friends are just not interested in stuff like that. I still think it's, you know, there's just too much evidence. Uh, there's too much stuff um, that links Pakime or Casas Grandes to the, to the north. T-Doors, one thing. If you, if you uh, map, you know, everybody knows T-Doors. You know, it used to be, you know, the park starts to tell you a T-Door guy has a backpack on his back. That's why it's a T-Door. Ah, you know. T-Doors are exterior doors. They're meant to, you know, they define your house. A door means a lot. And that's what somebody sees when they come into your house. Oh, they're, they're part of that T-Door group. I don't think I'm gonna go in there. <laughs> Or they're part of that T-door group. They all give me some food, you know. Um, tell us who you are. If you, if you mapped, and someday I will do this, or get some student to do it. Uh, the first T-doors are at Chaco in the exterior walls of great houses. That's where they are, all right? And a few of the, few of the uh, outliers, the great house outliers. Chaco moves to Aztec, and they get democratized. Everybody has T-doors on the exteriors. You see them all over Mesa Verde, and that's, you know, Mesa Verde was part of Aztec's world. Um, and then when things fall apart, in 1275, and it all falls apart, and there's a class revolt, and the nobles go away, and everybody else just leaves because the whole place is, you know, they don't want to live that way anymore, and they forget it and all that stuff. You never see T-doors up north again. There's, you know, an odd window that by accident is a T-shape or something like that, but if you go to Casas Grandes, there are T-doors everywhere, all right? Interior, exterior, T-doors all over the place. T-doors in all the uh, cliff dwellings in Sierra Madres. The T was so important, the T aperture was so important that there's two of these things that are uh, were called altars, and they probably were, that are stone, perfectly squared off stone like so with a T cut in it. That are you know, up on, on mounts, and they're, they're, they're set up like altars. I mean, I, I don't think we know, but I, I have no problem with that. That T shape, the, the, the penetration, the T, the, the void, it's a T shape, goes Chaco, Aztec, Pakime. I mean, stuff like that, that, you know, that's not independent invention, I mean, for heaven's sakes. Okay, uh, Casas Grandes goes away in 1450, like everything else does. Um, if you go straight south from there, you hit Culiacan on the coast of Sinaloa, which was the northernmost Mesoamerican uh, city that starts at 1400, something like that, the, you know, the, the big part of it. That's where all the conquistadors launch from. They go, you know, they're, they're in civilization until they get to Culiacan. Then they have to go out in the wilderness beyond there. So there may be something in it. What's really cool about the Chaco Meridian is it starts 500 years earlier than I knew that uh, the, I described, uh, not very sympathetically, the Pecos system with, with uh, basket maker 3P1234, where they, you know, first they get corn, then they get pottery, then they get, okay, fine. For each of those stages, and those stages are real, and at least they are, the differences between them are enough that even archeologists can notice them. 
Um, for each of those stages, the biggest, weirdest, most important, interesting sites, each of those stages is on that meridian. Basket Maker 3, it's huge basket maker sites of chocolate. P1, it's Ridges Basin and Blue Mesa, it's just south of Durango. Just five, five or six times bigger than the next biggest P1 site with all kinds of weird architecture, towers. I mean, no, nobody in P1 builds towers. He's got, you know, stuff like that. P2, it's Chaco, P3, it's Aztec, and then P4, it's... But, it, you know, there's a real wind-up before the pitch. Questions about the evolution of Kachina religion. Um, for some of the stories that, that are, are ostensibly about Chaco, not ostensibly, that seem to be about Chaco, the Kachinas are actually living among the people, and they're people just sort of people-esque. Uh, there's actually... When they leave White House, there's battles between Kachinas and the humans. And Kachinas die, and humans die. And they, they still they do this at Acoma, uh, not every year, I think, but they, they recreate the battle with the Kachinas. It's after they, after they turn their backs, on the, or after they off the nobles, or get rid of the nobles and reinvent themselves, the, the Kachinas really come into prominence. And the, the Kachinas might have always been there. The Kachinas might have been there before Chaco in some other form and get suppressed. I don't think Chaco was a cheerful place. Remember them Rio Grande guys saying, you know, we don't talk about it. Bad stuff happened out there might have been suppressed and it comes back in a somewhat different form. Uh, for archaeologists, the earliest things that we can recognize as Kachinas, and this is not a good criteria, as you know, <laughs> we don't deal with Kachinas in the way that people do. Um, the earliest ones that I'm aware of are in Membrus, which is the same time as Chaco. And you see the, you see the images in Membrus. Um, you don't see, this is actually a talk I gave last night. Uh, yeah, everybody knows Membrus, the black one pottery from southwest New Mexico, people doing stuff. We think it's real cute, right? There's bunnies and, and this and that and the other thing. And then there's, then there's bowls where somebody's taking somebody else's head off, all right? I don't think they thought it was cute. Um, uh, I'll make this quick. That I think that that's a, an ideology that gets developed in members that's sort of anti-Chaco. It's sort of holding their communities together. And people, you know, Chaco could have had anything it wanted. They're exactly contemporary. We think that pottery's really cool. I bet there's, I bet there's people with members, you know, jewelry on tonight. Um, you don't see that figurative pottery outside the members area. There's none of it at Chaco. There's hardly any members at Chaco. Even though they, you know, they, they share macaws, they share turquoise, they share everything else, that pottery does not move outside the members area. I think those things, the little bunnies that we think are so cute, you know, I think that unless you were part of members, you didn't want to be eating your Wheaties out of that, that bowl. I mean, it meant something. It meant something. You know, another way to say this is that when they bury people, they bury them with a bowl over their head. I mean, this is, they're not upending their morning breakfast bowl. This is, you know, the images, the ge geometric stuff, that really meant something. And it doesn't show up, it doesn't show up over here. The early member stuff shows up over here, but you don't find that later member stuff over here, and you don't find it, you don't find it outside of members. So maybe they're cooking up, not cooking up, I don't want to sound, this is not a subject to be glib about, but you know, maybe Kachinas come out of, out of members, you know, and it, it's when they're, it's, they experiment after Chaco, you can see they experiment with lots of different ways of thinking about the world to reinvent a society without nobles. There's all these art styles that come and go, and we call them cults. I don't know if that's a good word or not, but it's like a Darwinian competition of cults, and, and uh, members may be part of that, where those ideas that percolate up out of members, they, those are useful. Those could, no, of course they're useful. I mean, Kachinas are holy people that help the people, so that's a good thing. You don't need the leaders anymore. You got the Kachinas. The, the question is about uh, this north-south axis, uh, which is pretty clear at Chocolate. There's buildings that are very cardinal, very north-south-east-west but specifically about uh, a pine tree, big pine tree, big ponderosa, that was growing in the plaza, or, the, or Neil Judd, the, one of the excavators of Pueblo Benito, found the stump of this pine tree in, in the plaza of Pueblo Benito, and whether that was part of the axis. Uh, the, the tree is very clearly prehistoric. I mean, the tree ring guys dated it to, I don't know what, but it's, it's early, like it's before 1000 AD. Uh, Chip Wills over at, at New Mexico, who wants the place, wants chocolate to be Pueblos, I guess. Um, has argued in an article that some rancher dragged that thing in <laughs> later. You know, that it wasn't really growing there, that it was a stump, and they brought the stump in because they were making a, a brush corral or something like that. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing Chip justice. If you're really interested in this, you should read his article in American Antiquity. Flip side is that that was a big tree, and, and by 1000 AD, there weren't any big trees in Chocolate unless they wanted them there, you know, unless they spared them, because you know, hundreds of thousands of beams went into you know, building those buildings. And most of them came from 80 miles away on somebody's shoulders, or you know, somebody's toting them. So if there was a big, big tree growing at Benito, it, was, it wasn't an accident because they wanted it there, and it was really important. Um, you know, what is the Chaco Meridian? Chaco Meridian for me is like a kilometer wide. I mean, these guys are not working with yodelites, they're not working with GPS. They're working with a piece of piece of string and a rock. So the Meridian does this, you know. 
and they don't they can't determine longitude um, we couldn't do that until 18th century to determine you know where you are absent backsighting absent you know looking and saying oh I'm due north of that if you can't see that whatever that is you know the, the crack in the door or something you can't see it anymore you can't reestablish where you are you have to have to reestablish north and there's going to be a little error um, so the meridian is a wide thing it could well be that the meridian comes from that tree and you know Aztecs off by a little bit but you know what's a what's a half kilometer among friends yeah. but yeah the, I mean the interesting thing on the tree is that it's in play as archaeologists uh, you know making Chaco a mystery uh, two questions one about warfare and cannibalism in Chaco and I'll answer that one first and then about people from Chaco moving south into Mexico into Mesoamerica or into what is today Mexico but actually internally within Mesoamerica um, warfare uh, Chaco is kind of remarkable in that there was not a lot of warfare while Chaco was on, in charge which is a good thing there's about a century there of not a lot there's always some there's all you know people human beings are no damn good there's always some fussing going on all right but there's not villages being wiped out and again I, I really like architecture more than pottery and else. architecture doesn't move and it's big the commoners are living in individual family houses where you have one family maybe 10 people you know extended family here and a quarter mile away is another one a quarter mile away is another one sometimes they're more clustered than that but they aren't living in defensive settings. You know, they don't have walls around them. And they, you know, they're, they're living separate, so they're not worried. I'm sure bad things still happen, but you know, generally speaking, they're not worried. And when Chaco moves to Aztec, the wheels come off and that ends, and they, they circle the wagons. They make these huge Mesa Verde sites where they, they bring in a whole lot of these little family houses, build a wall around it with a spring in the middle, that's Sand Canyon. Now, for those of you that know that Fort Clark, or, or any of a dozen big towns, that's the cliff dwellings. They're not living in the cliff dwellings because they're cute and because, you know, Vincent Scully would like them, you know, 100 years later or 500 years later, whatever that was. They're, they're, they're living in those cliff dwellings because they're scared. Um, so, yeah, there's peace during Chaco's time and then the, the wheels come off and that's, I think, when the class revolt happens is the nobles aren't doing their jobs. You know, we have war, we have drought, off with their heads. Um, second question is, did people move into Mexico? And I think the nobles did. <laughs> the noble families... Well, the story, okay, the stories. Um, every Pueblo, not every Pueblo, but a lot of Pueblos I've talked to have some clan that went south and never came back, right? And even the Acoma stories, they talk about uh, the Care stories where they leave White House and they have a ceremony for getting stuff like that. Half the people, is a long story. It's a good story. Um, half the people stop and found Acoma, the other half keep going. And they don't know where they went. And some of them come back as traitors with macaws and, you know, Turquoise and copper and stuff like that later, but they don't really know where they wound up. Um, for Casas Grandes, and I'm hoping that people here know Casas Grandes, it's the third great, last great city, third and last great city in the southwest. It's in Chihuahua. And uh, that's the one with the tea doors. The local Indians there, when the conquistadors come through, and, and there's some mysteries to who the local Indians were, because they, <laughs> after the conquistadors came through, there weren't, le there weren't many of them left. Um, but the conquistadors, not the warriors, but the guys that were writing stuff down, recorded a story by the Indians around Casas Grandes who talked about the site. And they said, yeah, you know, two brothers led huge groups of people out of the north heading straight south. And they bumped into a hag, an old lady, a witch, sitting on a huge rock of iron. And the witch said, one of you founds a city here, the rest of you keep going. All right? Which is what happened. One of them founded the city, and the rest of them keep going, heading south. I'll get back to them in a minute. In the 1860s, before there's any scientific archaeology down there, there were some guys from the local village of, of Casas Grandes who were looking for treasure in the ruins, and they found one of the biggest meteorites in North America. <laughs> it's Casas Grandes meteorite. You can go see it in the Smithsonian. <laughs> What's left of it? They saw it in half. You know what you do with meteorites if you're into this kind of stuff, if you want the mineralogy and all that sort of stuff. So you can see half of it there. Uh, the rest of it's been sought up and sent around the world to people who study meteorites. But it's an archaeological specimen, and the way they described finding it was in the ruin all wrapped up in cloth, and, you know, here's the giant iron rock. I don't think the meteorite fell there. I think they probably, you know, brought, well, I don't know, I mean, they probably brought it there. Okay, the, the bunch that kept going, all right, and all those clans that Pueblo people say, yeah, there's, you know, this clan went further south and never came back. We don't know where they are. They're probably in Guatemala now. They may be in Guatemala now. Um, in the early post-classic, what was Chaco's world? The early post-classic. It was really dynamic. You had the fall of, of Teotihuacan, which was kind of a, it was the center, a huge city that, that didn't necessarily control an empire, but it just set the tone for Mesoamerica for hundreds of years. It falls and all these little polities pop up, little polities that look exactly like Chaco, with multiple noble families and all the rest of it. 
Um, so I just told you what I think Chaco is, really. Uh, <laughs> but what else is going on there is all these migrations out of the north, the Chichimecs, and everybody claims they're a Chichimec over in Tarascan country, over in the you know, Aztec country. They're all coming out of the north. And there's this, it's a, both a domino effect and I think an interbraided stream of people coming out of the north uh, that, that create the, the early post-classic and, and ultimately the Aztecs are, are out of the north. They're from Aztlan, maybe from up here. We, we say that didn't happen because we, we nationalized the archaeology. Um, the timing isn't good for Chaco to become uh, the Aztecs. I don't, I, but I think they're part of that domino, you know, string of dominoes or this braided stream of people. They're part of that really dynamic early and middle post-classic history in Mesoamerica where folks are just moving all over the place. And I think some of those guys were from the, you know, originally from up here. What uh, concrete connections with Cahokia can you relate? That's a real good question. As far as I know, there's nothing from Chaco Cahokia and nothing from Cahokia Chaco. Uh, flip side is that if you had something from Chaco Cahokia, the archaeologist there would, would kick it back in the, in the, in the pit. Uh, they, really, <laughs> they really don't want to hear about long distance stuff. I mean, the, in the Mississippi Valley, you have, if you, if you picked a site and said, what looks like Mesoamerica? Cahokia with the hugest pyramid and this plaza surrounded by a smaller pyramids or Chaco that, you know, has these big buildings. If you said, which one looks like Mesoamerica? There's no question, it's Cahokia, okay? What, okay, so it's a big deal. I'll, I'll fall back, there are, there's turquoise uh, that makes it to the Mississippian world, doesn't make it to Cahokia as far as I know, but there's turquoise that makes it to big, Missi this is called Mississippian. These big Mississippian sites like Spiro, places like that. Uh, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of pounds of Pacific Coast shell that makes it to Spiro that probably went through Chaco. Um, but I'll take it into historic times, and this is not so much upstreaming as, I don't think it's upstreaming. Coronado, to pick on Coronado again, he comes up in New Mexico and raises hell and goes to one pueblo and he's looking for cities of gold and it's not gold, so they say, well, maybe you should go a little further than that next pueblo, it's made out of gold. Ah, you know. <laughs> he, he goes there, he goes there, and he finally winds up at Pecos. And Pecos is not made of gold either. But Pecos is the big trading center on the plains. And Pecos is at the same latitude, almost exactly, as Spiro, which is the, the southeasternmost, this is backwards for you, southeasternmost Mississippian trade entrepot, uh, trade center. It's connected with, with Cahokia, for sure. Um, a lot of stuff there is from Cahokia, uh, this fancy stuff that they have at Spiro. So uh, at, at Pecos, they get tired of having these conquistadors and these guys around because they're eating a lot and behaving badly. They say, well, if you don't like this, we have this guy here who, who the Spanish called a Turk, who is not a Pueblo Indian. He's Native American. He's not a Pueblo Indian. He says, yeah, I can show you where cities are. And he describes boats 200 feet long with all guys, you know, guys paddling in a river that was a mile wide or, or a league or whatever their unit of measurement was with, with uh, towers, he called them, which were pyramids. And he's describing the Mississippi Valley. All right? So Coronado, take, and the Turks, uh, Coronado says, okay, this sounds, this sounds good. This is what we're after. He goes... He goes pretty much due east. He's headed towards Sparrow at that point until the Spanish are going across the southern Great Plains and they don't like it very much and they think the Turk is lying to them, all right, and they strangle them. And then they wander all over the place. They go to Kansas and they say, ah, Kansas is not what we're after. And they go, you know, they go back down. Um, the Turk was just doing his job, all right? The Turk who is at Pecos knows about, you know, Koki has come and gone at that point, but he knows about the cities along the Mississippi Valley and he's taking the Spanish there. Um, Concrete evidence uh, that would say, well, uh, no, uh, but I would, I would assert that it'd be safe to, safe to think that they knew, knew about each other. I mean, it's a leader's job to know what's over the hill and what's over the plains. But good question. Sir. <laughs> Actually, part of the answer, okay, the question is about uh, whether Membrus knew about uh, Chaco and um, a speaker here who studies in the Membrus area, uh, apparently you asked that question, he said, no, it's too far. Um, yeah, and and the, the real question was, why do PhDs have <laughs> tunnel vision? Uh, part of that, I think, is because the scale of a PhD research. You know, you're a single scholar, you've got to prove yourself, you got, you got to prove yourself on a project, and your project, it's really difficult to do a PhD dissertation and not go broke, you know, over 10 years, that's big. You got to, you know, we're, we're sort of, that's the scale that we teach our kids to think in, is, is you know, here's a project. Uh, part of that's turf. I mean, just to be blunt about it, part of it's turf. Uh, I gave a talk last night in, in Tucson. It was all about how Chaco and members interacted. I mean, the evidence is all over the place, all right? If you don't want to see it, you don't want to see I mean, we, it's quite possible for people to ignore 
40,000 tons, 30 feet tall, size of a major league baseball field. You know, if you can ignore that, then you know you can ignore their roads and members. There's, you know, there's all. Okay. When Chaco comes online, make a long, long story short, I work in members. That's where I work these days. That's where I started. That seems to be where I'm ending. That when Holcom's going strong, you know, 700 to 1,000, something like that, um, going really strong and expanding, members, it's like a weather main. They pay a lot of attention to, to Holcom. They do the cremations. They, they do everything but the ball courts. Everything but the ball courts. Some of the members, half, the other half of the members don't do that stuff. And that's an interesting question. Is, you know, why did some of the members do this and, and others didn't? Holcom shrinks back on Phoenix. You know, the wheels come off for Holcom. Chaco comes online. It's a one-two punch, and they're, they're like a weather vane. All of a sudden, they start making little stone pueblos and doing corrugated, you know, indented corrugated pottery and making this fancy black and white stuff and, look, and having roads and things that look like little great houses. Um, you know, me members is a really good um, index for what's going on in the Southwest because they're affected by these things. And, you know, if, if the Members Valley people don't want to acknowledge that, that's, I suppose, that's their privilege. Yeah. Sir. I, one of them, good friend, Roger, Roger Anion was at this talk um, that I gave last night, and he wasn't speaking to <laughs> I said, Roger, what do you think about that? He said, well, at least it's over with. <laughs> Roger's a good man. You should have Roger up here sometime. Yeah. Sir? There's always people at Zuni. The question's about Zuni. Uh, you know, it's a two-part question. Oh, well, it's a one-part question. It's, uh, that to be a linguistic isolate, you need to be isolated for a long while. And, you know, some people say 5,000 years, some people say not so long. Um, so where, were, where was Zuni when all this was going on? There are always people at Zuni. I mean, from early, early days on, some of the earliest irrigation agriculture on the plateau is around Zuni, and there's always people there. It's just a, ni a nice place to live, I guess. Um, certainly the Zunis think so. Um, I think they were there. There were people there. I mean, there are chocolate great houses at Zuni, all around Zuni. There's a village of the Great Kivas is right up the valley from Zuni, and there's all kinds of chocolate communities around there. So there are people there, whether they're the modern Zuni or not, I don't know. Zunis would say they were, and you bet you, uh, you, bet you they were. Um, Zunis have stories that, that probably relate to uh, uh, Chaco, uh, not as dramatic as White House. A Zuni government, um, back in the 19th century, uh, they, had, they had noble families. They had families that didn't work. And they made the decisions. This has changed over the years. So, you know, so the real power is in the, the elders who pray and that kind of stuff. But the way Cushing describes it, and of course Cushing might not know what he's talking about, but he said there's a, the, the, the great house at the center of the world is where the, noble, the families who made the decisions and who didn't work lived. Which, you know, that sounds a lot like what I think is going on in, in great houses, just a little more benign. Um, the, the linguistic isolation of Zuni, uh, the fact it's a linguistic isolate, I don't know. I'm not a linguist. It's a puzzle. Uh, Southwestern linguistics is a puzzle. Uh, my guess is that we don't know as much about the formational linguistic isolates as the linguists would like us to think. Um, but, or maybe we do. You know, maybe they had to you know, be I linguistically isolated, if not socially isolated, because clearly they weren't that for, for 5,000 years. I mean, some reason why nobody else wanted to speak Zuni, just like nobody else wanted to be members. Um, I'm making this up, all right? Um, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer to that. I mean, there were people at Zuni while all this is going on. Absolutely, there are lots of people around Zuni. So whoever was there is all wrapped up in it. And I, it's hard for me to believe, and Zuni certainly would object if I said that they weren't you know, the ancestors of the people that are there today. So they were there, and they were in the middle of it. You're right. Dave Wilcox, who's a really smart guy, and, and Dave Gregory is also the author on that, uh, had a really good book, a multidisciplinary look from all kinds of different you know, perspectives on, on Zuni origins. And I thought those guys thought, uh, said that they were isolated in the Amogion uplands for a while, but I think Dave's kind of backed off on that. The opinion of all his authors was against that. <laughs> he still published the book, which is great. That's good scholarship. The question is, what, what was White House? Um, I mean, there is a White House at Canyon de Chez, which is named because of the white, but that, you know, that's not the White House. White House is a, a, a name for this area that I've heard some of people say it's just the Four Corners. And then other people, people say it's Mesa Verde because that's, that's famous, it's in the news. Uh, most people, probably people say, yeah, it was, it was Chaco. It was that, you know, that series of events is what that story is talking about. So White House or White City is the whole thing. It's, you know, it's the whole settlement, it's the whole city. In fact, there, there's some accounts of that that translate it as White City, but I imagine that most of the people who are doing the translating say, well, Pueblos can't have cities, so they turn it to White House, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Just like the Navajo guy said, you know, he's really our king, but no, we don't have a word for king. Questions about uh, if noble families from Chaco went to Casas Grandes, where are the palaces? I would say that Casas Grandes, the whole city, is, is an elite city. 
and all the goodies are there. When, when Mike and Mike Whalen and Paul Minister are digging the, you know, the sort of secondary sites and even, uh, actually people haven't dug too many commoner houses down there. You don't have all the stuff that's just all over the place at Casa. So I think if you took all the great houses of Chaco, where the nobles lived, and pressed them into a cube, uh, you know, the enclosed architectural space, be a cube like that. If you did that at Aztec ruins, it's a cube like that. And if you do it at Pakimi, it's a cube like that. So, you know, there's, it's smaller and smaller and more and more compact. And I think the whole site there probably is, is important people. And then, you know, the commoners are living out in the countryside. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.